Welcome to the um, Nurturing Young Leaders uh, webinar series. I'm Tan Po Hong, an adjunct associate professor with the uh, Department of Real Estate at uh, NUS. This series is organized by the NUS Department of Real Estate and the Institute of Real Estate and Urban Studies. Today's session is the seventh installment in this series. The earlier segments have focused on specific real estate sectors, more what I would call the verticals. Today, we discuss a more cross-cutting issue, more of a horizontal topic being sustainability and the art. This sustainability and the art contribute to a livable city and are therefore important components of the real estate market. We have two distinguished panelists this afternoon, panelists who, are, who have wide ranging and diverse experience and who will give their take on this topic. We have Ms. Chong Siak Chin, the CEO of the National Gallery of Singapore, and Dr. Lai Chu Melondi, an urban specialist. And so without further ado, may I now introduce the first panelist, Ms. Chong Siak Chin. Ms. Chong has been the Chief Executive Officer of the National Gallery Singapore as a head of the Visual Arts Cluster, the VAC Singapore, since April 2013. The VAC comprises the Singapore Art Museum, Singapore Tyler Print Institute and the National Gallery Singapore. Prior to this, Ms. Chong was the President and CEO of Ascendus from 2001 and was recognized as the Outstanding CEO of the Year in the Singapore Business Awards 2009 for her leadership and for her dynamism in establishing Ascendus as Asia's leading provider of business space. Ms. Chong graduated from the National University of Singapore in 1981 with honors in estate management. That means she's an alumni of the Department of Real Estate. She also obtained a master's in business administration in 1991. She completed the advanced management program at Harvard Business School in 1998. Ms. Chong was awarded a gold medal by the Singapore Institute of Surveyors and Valuers in 1981. That means she was a top student in that year. She's also got the NUS Distinguished Alumni Award by the Faculty of Architecture and Building Management in 1999 and has been given the NUS Distinguished Alumni Service Award in 2009. She was appointed as Justice of the Peace in 2013 and is currently Singapore's non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Chile. Second panelist is Dr. Lai Chu Maloni. She is currently a Singapore-based urban specialist with a wide portfolio of academic research and consultancy experience. Dr. Maloni has taught urban policy, urban planning, and environmental planning at the School of Design and Environment at NUS. As founding director of the Center of Sustainable Cities, she has led multidisciplinary teams of researchers to work on various urban issues, particularly those related to sustainable urban development, with a focus on city densification, sustainability performance, and benchmarking, urban greenery, and resource conservation. She has a deep interest on how these subjects relate to city growth, to economic development, social well-being, and city culture. Prior to academia, Dr. Melondi has worked 
with the Singapore government in several areas of public policy, including strategic planning and heritage conservation. She has served as board member of the National Parks Board from 2011 to 2018, as well as other committees and think tanks. Internationally, she consults with city and national governments, as well as organizations such as UNESCO and UNESCO. And with that introduction, may I pass the floor to you, Sakchin? Thank you so much, uh, Po Hong, for the introduction. And uh, let me also thank uh, the NUS Real Estate Department for this invitation to join all of you in this panel together with uh, Lai Chu to speak about sustainability and uh, art. Well, we, we are living through very interesting times. Uh, and COVID-19 has indeed uh, changed the world, and I think no sector has been spared. But the positive uh, is that COVID-19 had forced us to either slow down, for example, to cut travel, which is good for the environment, or accelerate um, some of our plans, for example, on uh, digitalization, or completely review our priorities. Um, and all these mean change, a change to our lives, a change to our work. So I thought I'll start by speaking about change and the role that art plays in driving change or coping with change, making reference to uh, real estate. And since on this panel is an expert in urban planning, which is uh, uh, Lai Chu, uh, I will use an urban planning example to kick off. I'm not sure, you know, how familiar uh, some of you may be, but Bilbao in Spain was a thriving port city in the early 60s and a major industrial town in the 80s, but it started to see a severe decline in jobs due to deindustrialization in the 90s. But art and architecture came to the rescue. With the development of the Frank Gehry designed Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which opened in 1997, completely turned the city around. And today, it is a vibrant destination for the arts, for creative services, and a major tourist destination. So this is an excellent example of how you know, art has helped to revitalize a city and enabled it to get back on its feet, um, having gone through severe challenges um, in its economic structure. Another example closer to home, which is the next slide, is the National Gallery Singapore, where because of art and for art, two historical monuments have been repurposed from the former Supreme Court on the left, the one with the dome, and the former city hall, which is the one on the right. Um, the French architect, uh, Jean-Francois Milou, who won a international competition of among 151 architects, um, has now very beautifully and very sensitively restored it. Um, and it is now a public institution open to uh, the public to come in and enjoy uh, art. And repurposing of old buildings is again another excellent example of pursuing sustainability in the built environment. Moving on to another uh, example of uh, how art has also helped to make us rethink uh, the natural beauty. And this is uh, a work of art by Charles Lim, a local Singapore artist. So sometime between January to December last year, the gallery's Ng Teng Fong roof garden was transformed by Charles. He removed, if you see the, the picture on top, he removed all these nicely manicured uh, landscape plants, shrubs, trees, and he replaced them with 30 lesser known local plant species that were found on reclaimed land. They were just plants that are growing out of the sand and you know, uh, there was um, use for reclamation. 
And for one entire year, the roof garden of the gallery uh, became kind of a microcosm of the plant ecosystem that thrives on undeveloped reclaimed land in Singapore. And these natural wild plants helped, in fact, attracted butterflies, all kinds of insects to the roof. And people just, you know, enjoyed it and felt that, you know, the wild can be equally beautiful um, from uh, what is often, you know, manicured and uh, used in our buildings. So sometimes beauty lies in unexpected places. And it also helps us, this particular work of art also helps us to question some of our own practices, landscaping practices, and ask if we could adopt a more natural and sustainable approach. Um, but I must admit that I'm oversimplifying Charles Lin's message behind the artwork, uh, which he calls Proclamation Garden. Uh, because it, uh, well, Proclamation Garden has relevance to both planning and real estate, particularly in Singapore, where land being our scarcest commodity and only through reclamation then followed by proclamation of the reclaimed land that it becomes developable. Um, this, you know, in a way is Charles' way of also commenting about uh, man and human intervention of, uh, of the sea and how sea, a different form, transform into uh, land which then becomes state-owned um, all through man-human uh, intervention. But Behind it is also this idea of how innovative thinking with extensive engineering allows us, you know, an uh, island nation like Singapore to also achieve uh, growth and sustainability. The fourth uh, point that I'd like to share, which also emphasizes this, this point that art does sometimes challenge us to rethink and reimagine the world differently. Uh, and rethinking, reimagining the world uh, is so important a skill for this COVID world that we are in. So what you see here, believe it or not, is a work of art. The French artist called Marcel Duchamp, a hundred years ago, um, created an uproar in the art world when he presented an industrial object, which is a urinal, uh, just turned it around and he called it the fountain. And this was in 1917. And I thought this was a particularly apt example because we all can relate to it, right? Uh, urinal. But what Marcel Duchamp has done is that he recontextualized an everyday object into a work of art, promoting the idea of art as a concept, not just an object. And this uh, work of art is arguably the most intellectually and also intellectually captivating and also a very challenging art piece uh, of, the ninth, of the 20th century. And till today, it is still cited as a major force of change in the course of art uh, history. You could also say that uh, Marcel Duchamp is promoting recycling and sustainability, converting everyday objects uh, into art. And many other artists, in fact, did follow, uh, including Andy Warhol, you know, youth, uh, Campbell soup cans, etc., as inspiration. So you can see that artists are actually one of the earliest disruptors or drivers of change. Uh, and exposure to the art helps us helps to develop uh, critical thinking and also to promote alternative uh, views. I, I think that skill is particularly relevant in today's world where things are not always black or white and we need to learn how to navigate many different perspectives and points of view. In art education, uh, for example, we work with kids to counter the current mental model that there's always one right answer or there's only one right answer. In art, there are many right answers uh, and we want the kids to find their own right answer. And, and while I'm at this uh, subject of the purpose, the value of art, I could also share that um, art has a healing power uh, as well. Art therapy is uh, recognized as a recognized field of psychotherapy and the good news for older generation like myself, uh, studies have shown that art therapy in fact prevents cognitive decline and improves the memory of people with dementia. We, we undertook a study with NUS Mind Center 
and registered evidence to show that the cognitive ability uh, and the brain activity of the, of the people with dementia improved after uh, encounters with art. And there's also studies to show that there's a pos positive correlation between art activity and lowering of stress levels. And besides the aesthetic value of art, the therapeutic uh, value, there's, art is also a good investment. Some of my, my art collector friends tell me that the asset class that gave them the highest returns over the years is their art collection. And I've always thought that art is also another form of real asset, like real estate. Uh, it makes a very good investment, not just financially, but you know, as you can see for visual appreciation and for our health and well-being. In fact, the most expensive piece of art sold today is uh, Salvador Mondi by Leonardo da Vinci. It was sold in 2017 for $400 million. And that work of art is 500 years old. So, you know, in terms of longevity, it, it's, you know, can be as, uh, can be older than most of the real estate that we find in this world. And the value retention and appreciation, in fact, is very high. Um, but interestingly, if you all recall, not so long ago, many Singaporeans have rated artists as the number one most unessential worker. Uh, ben Strait Science did this survey, right? Um, but then we also probably forgot that many of us kept ourselves sane during this circuit breaker, listening to music, watching Netflix, um, reading, and that is all art, you know? Uh, and, and we kind of may have taken for granted the value of art uh, when we, uh, when it's maybe so uh, abundant and accessible, uh, but the, uh, we should not underrate that and uh, can, you know, uh, can we have a balanced and sustainable life without art? Well, I doubt so. So maybe let me stop here and I'll be happy to expand more on the topic uh, later on during Q&A. Over to you, Fuhua. Thank you, uh, Sekjin, for, for bringing forth art and how it can contribute to our sustainability, health-wise, financial-wise, and so on. Um, Perhaps I will now move on to our second pin, uh, panelist uh, to give us her take on this topic. So, uh, Lai Chu, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Pahong, and thank you to the department uh, for inviting me uh, to this um, uh, webinar. Really, um, art, uh, sustainability, uh, subjects. Um, close to heart and uh, I'm happy to, to do this uh, presentation. Um, I have entitled um, the presentation Sustainability, the Arts, the Pandemic. And um, this is my, my little attempt actually to try to draw some linkages uh, across uh, these three sectors and perhaps discuss the implications for the city in terms of urban planning and real estate. Uh, for this title slide, I have chosen, you all recognize this famous painting, The Scream, uh, by the Norwegian uh, artist Edward Munch, done in 1893. You can see the, the agonized face in the painting, and this has now become one of the most iconic images of art, seen as symbolizing the anxiety of the human condition. And I think perhaps a very apt image for the purpose of our discussion about the current COVID-19 pandemic. But I think more importantly, I want to show you this lesser known self-portrait of Munch himself, the artist. He caught the Spanish flu. He got the flu, the Spanish flu at the time, uh, where millions of people died uh, during, that, um, during that pandemic, and he survived. And it was during the midst of the pandemic that he painted this self-portrait. And you can see how he tried to depict himself as in terms of his closeness to death. And here his hair is all 
written out and he looks very jaundiced and he's all wrapped up in his dressing gown with a blanket around him. And it's a very sad and pathetic image. And I guess this is the kind of, this is the condition that best epitomize what I want to discuss today. The uh, art as personified by this piece of, uh, by this, by the artist. Uh, the virus pandemic as personified by its condition. And of course, sustainability, sustenance, life and death. Um, and of course, overall the pain and suffering associated with disease as, um, as really very well captured in this painting. So I think looking at this, you can see what I'm trying to, uh, some of the lessons and some of the um, messages I'm trying to, to draw. Let me start with sustainability. I'm going to divide this presentation into four parts. First, I'm going to talk about sustainability in the art sector. Second, I'm going to talk about well, the pandemic itself and its relationship to arts. Third, I'm going to talk about arts and perhaps a bit of impact and adaptation because of the pandemic. And lastly, of course, linking back to urban planning and real estate responses. Now, we did this project some years ago uh, for, for MND, looking at sustainable growth and some of the features as well as uh, indicators of sustainable growth. And we developed this framework. In this framework, what we do is we put the four different key sectors that comprises the urban, urban system of a city. We look at the economy, the environment, resources, people and culture. And what is quite clear is that um, a lot of our efforts relating to the environment, you look at air quality, waste, transport, and how we try to protect or conserve our resources. A lot of all that is actually related to how we want to enhance quality of life and livability in the built environment, as well as support community well-being. And so therefore, within the sector of people and culture, we have encapsulated quite a number of different areas, health, education, social cohesion, safety, and included in that is arts and culture. And here, what we're trying to say is that art and culture can contribute to well-being and quality of life. And this is actually well considered by many other studies. Um, OECD talks about, you know, how well-being, livelihood is actually related to not just to basic needs like health, uh, wealth and um, quality of the environment, but also embrace sectors that um, relate to people's ability to pursue goals, happiness, satisfaction, life satisfaction, freedom, and closely associated with intellectual, spiritual, cultural pleasure and pursuits. And this is where art and culture, the art and culture sector comes in. Art and culture in the context of cities and in the pursuit of sustainability, I think there are four key areas that we can look at. Uh, its contribution to social sustainability through its linkages to human well-being and social development, its contribution to environmental and economic elements of sustainable growth, um, if you think about how cities have shifted from industrial-based to knowledge-based economies, you find that jobs in the creative sectors, in the arts, in the cultural sectors, are potentially new areas, of new avenues to enhance productive capacities within cities without harming the environment. So a lot of the new jobs in the green sector are in fact um, in the arts uh, area, in the cultural sector, and they are actually very important in terms of pushing for new ways of uh, doing things in the city that does not have any impact or have minimal impact on the environment. Now we use uh, the framework and we did an assessment actually uh, for Singapore in terms of art culture and sustainability. I won't go through the full assessment. I want to highlight to you a few elements. Eh? some of the things that we have found out, which was actually presented to MND. But I, I have to admit that my slides here are uh, not updated. We finished the project around about 
2014, 2015, and these are the uh, data we have up to then. So, so don't don't be too. Um, there might have been changes, and things have changed. Can fill on fill up on this maybe later on. Uh, we talk about how people support the art sector, and there's all there is a, an increase, but has actually been leveling off. It got to a almost like almost like a saturation point. Uh, we also look at government funding, and it's interesting because government funding for the arts has actually increased, uh, although. The last few years has actually also leveled off, but it has increased quite significantly in the period in the early 2013, 2014. Even so, um, its its proportion in the um, in the um, GDP is actually very small, 0.13 percent in 2014. I think it's hovering around that even up to now. Uh, we look at support for the art sector, not just in terms of government funding, but also in terms of uh, donations. Uh, we call this art philanthropy. And I think this is a very important area because in many cities, art cannot survive on government funding alone and depends hugely on private sector uh, donation. Uh, in Singapore, unfortunately, it has not grown a lot. And I think this is an area that would have some impact in terms of longer term sustainability because we cannot rely on the government to continue to support the arts. And I think a lot of it will have to gradually come from uh, a lot more from the private sector as well. Um, I think in terms of, I think we mentioned here a little bit about the its impact in relation to the economy. It's not big, as I said just now, but um, uh, there has been some total value increase or value add through uh, jobs in the art sector. Uh, in terms of, in absolute terms, in fact, it has grown, but in terms of a percentage to GDP, it has also not performed that well. And I think these are a few snapshot pictures. I, I don't think we'll go through the whole, all the, all the other aspects. But what we are seeing today is that there is a growing art sector perform uh, support is, although it is, um, it has a, a gradual increase, not huge, but increase. There is government support, but we are still not quite there as in terms of, uh, compared to many of the art capitals in the world with strong traditions and market support. Uh, the creative sector in Singapore is relatively small with a smaller, with a fairly small number of, of, of employees. But still, as part and parcel of the city and, the, of, and of, uh, in terms of planning of the city, we see the arts sector as, um, as important um, in terms of continue to actually create a more livable environment. Um, uh, there's growing participation rate, but it hasn't really reached the kind of a, um, a wide and a diverse uh, the wide and diverse segment of the society as as it, it, it could have. But undeniably, arts and culture is progressively contributing to the well-being and quality of life of residents here. And that was our conclusion in those, uh, as part of the um, discussion um, uh, in relation to sustainability. Um, I think uh, Sachin also alluded to this, um, to this, uh, uh, op-ed written by Professor Tommy Coe uh, just recently. And uh, it was quite clear that um, art is essential to life in the city. But in this, uh, he, he mentioned this survey and this survey actually says that people actually regard art as, as one of the lowest in terms of its essentiality to city life. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they highlighted that during the pandemic, especially COVID-19, um, uh, the doctors, nurses, and even the cleaners will rank more highly than artists, and artists really occupying really the bottom of the rung. But of course, Professor Ko is of course trying to support the sector and gave his take in terms of how important art, music, and writings, and music, and films, and theatre is important. Um, and indeed, if we look at it from the city planning perspective, Art, the city is the milieu that fosters creative activities and art contributes to cultural vibrancy and social dynamism. It's an important part of community life, brings people together. 
it also, even though it's small, it contributes jobs and contributes to the economy. So from the urban planning and the design perspective, we have to continue to support uh, this sector. It is, it is essential uh, in the fullest sense of the word. So what I want to do now is to then swing the attention a little bit to, to talk about if it is not as well received even in peacetime, what about in times of the pandemic? All right. The, the pandemic is, is, is of course, the, the um, occupies our, our minds today, but pandemics is histor historically, there has been so many uh, pandemics that's affected human society. And, um, and this is encapsulated or captured in, in the art medium, especially the med uh, visual art medium in so many ways. Um, because art reflects life and art reflects a human condition, people's daily lives, their dreams, their aspirations, as well as their suffering and, and, and their aspirations and their celebrations. So um, pandemics like the, the Black Death in the 14th century and the Spanish flu later on, in fact, has produced very significant works of art that has depicted the human condition. And I'm just going to show two of them just to add some interest to, to this uh, discussion. Uh, this is uh, a very famous painting called The Citizens of Tunai in the Belgium. It's called Burying the Day. And it's very grim, very stark, and um, extremely uh, uh, depressing as a painting. But it's, it's, it's in its vividness, in its a very graphic form, it really, really shows the the kind of um, grief, the collective grief and the pain that people bear during the time. And you can see the expressions uh, of, of all these folks here. This is an even more um, a graphic portrayal. It is actually done by, um, it's Peter, uh, Peter Brewer's uh, famous Triumph of Death. Uh, it is a very, um, uh, in some ways it really um, highlights uh, destruction, death, and you can see all the um, all the the chaos um, and um, really um, uh, pain, suffering, as well as of course um, uh, uh, the, the 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 very depressing uh, situation in so far as uh, uh, society, uh, human life is is concerned, and really uh, uh, artists in its in its way. Uh, record for us what really happened uh, during that period. Uh, we, we read numbers, we read about 15, uh, how many millions of people who died and suffered, but really looking at paintings like this uh, brings home to us uh, the, the, the severity of the condition. Closer to home, uh, and more recently, uh, during the recent pandemic, uh, a lot of artists have across the world, not just in Asia, not just also in Singapore, has actually taken to devoting themselves to different types of artwork. This is actually done by an Indian artist. And it was interesting because um, you can see things that you can relate to, uh, you know, in a market, social distancing. See how they, this is what happened and all the masks that they wear. I was just saying about the, um, this Indian artist. Huh? And it was all about daily living, but also um, life during lockdown. Um, and I think art has always reflected men's daily uh, living conditions, but also it highlights the creativity and imagination of the artists, which thrive and flourish even under very adverse uh, conditions. So the third part that I want to now Move. And so earlier we were talk about relationship in art and um, and the pandemic. I want to talk a little bit about impacts and adaptation here. And I, I want to really look at two aspects of impact. One is the gig economy and secondly is the art market. Um, the gig economy, as we all know, is a um, is, um, sector that, uh, well, it is an area that Art, artists, many perform, performers, writers, and uh, 
form a large proportion of this economy, and they depend, and this they, they are the ones who, who, um, who, which is this is characterized by, uh, you know, the 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 prevalence of short term work, short term contracts, freelancing, and uh, it is a free market, but it is um it is highly dependent on um, commissions and uh, highly dependent on uh, short term uh, uh, efforts. So. And this is the what economy has actually been extremely affected by the pandemic, and even the government recognised that because you can see that uh, in the last few budgetary support um, provision, uh, there is actually provision to support people working in this economy. Uh, but that is an area that is uh, that whether there's the, the, the there's some major impact. Secondly, I think we need to look at the art market. The art market is actually char characterised by patronage. You need people to patronize, uh, patronage, uh, patronize the art. You need people to watch the shows. You need people to uh, attend the exhibitions and uh, buy art. And I think this is an area that will that is again impacted as in terms of uh, the the um, the active activity in the current market. Although I have to say that. Um, in uh, in a in a in a very recent uh, this is the art an article um, just in the recent Sunday uh, Sunday Times just a couple of days ago that it highlighted that in the very um, uh, high end sector where you have very major works uh, are being are being ex are being transacted uh, while the market has slowed down auction auction houses still find that there's some um, there's a fair amount of buying and selling. Uh, uh, where buyers are looking to shed valuable items to show up their balance sheets and uh, sellers are, are looking at um, uh, this, uh, selling off the major works and then buyers have reserves looking for cheap acquisitions. So you can actually see there's still, still some activity there. And this is um, a very famous, um, uh, well-known, um, I would say, um, transaction that took place where uh, Lichtenstein's uh, Nude with Joyous is a pop art actually fetch over 400 US million amidst uh, the pandemic. So it shows that in the major sector, in fact, there's still some major activity, but um, in, the, uh, in the rest of the, um, the market, I think there's a, a general uh, a downturn, which I think is going to, um, uh, would, would have got long-term implications on the um, uh, survival of the sector. Um, so I think the adaptation we are really seeing, I think some of you, I think Chit-Satching also alluded to that. We talk about harnessing the digital network ICT to bring art, uh, live streaming into the living room. Uh, you have got all the virtual, this is this is Emily of em Emerald Hill, which was shown and everybody was talking about it because they never get to see it when it was actually shown um, uh, uh, on stage, but actually they got to see it in the living room during the pandemic. And we got, and there's of course things like online auctions and virtual museum tours and a whole lot of other innovations that is taking place. And I think this is an area that will probably help to, to give the sector a little bit of a boost, a little bit of uh, support. But the other implication is, of course, support in terms of patronage and philanthropy. And I think this is an area that will continue to, to slide and will continue to need uh, a fair amount of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, attention to if you were to continue to see uh, further growth of this, uh, of this sector. So I think there are, there are uh, various uh, impacts and implications, and I think it is important uh, for us to, if we think in terms of city as planners, in terms of vibrancy of the city, life in the city, this, this is, these are areas that we need to look very closely into. So let me let me finish off in my last the last part of my this of this discussion. And I want to talk about the implications in terms of urban planning. I think there's been a lot of discussion in amongst the the planning fraternity and amongst uh, academics about what the what would be the new normal as in terms of planning, planning practice, planning theory. Uh, two areas have been extensively discussed and also of course in relation, this is actually directly linked to real estate. Two areas have been discussed uh, quite extensively. One is the neighborhood, rethinking the neighborhood. Um, and I think there's an increasing uh, interest 
uh, to see the neighborhood as the correct uh, module or the correct level at which to pitch resilience planning where you can actually talk about building communities, building social capital, bringing communities together to support each other during the period of uh, the pandemic. And of course, it's important when you start thinking about the neighborhood is in terms of disease control and management, the so-called zona approach where you try to delineate neighborhood boundaries to the extent that you don't want to allow too much crisscrossing, uh, very similar to the way we are now uh, zoning out, uh, zoning, uh, NUS as in terms of the different uh, areas. And I think this will have a lot of implications as in terms of the amenities that we provide in the neighborhood. And I think that term that the term that's now being used is uh, in terms of implication for the art is community art. Uh, we, we did a project for NEC also again a couple of years ago to look at community art as in terms of its implications for spatial planning and for design of neighborhood centers. And, and I would see that this is a major area that we can probably pay a little bit more attention to in the future, even in the case of uh, Singapore. And of course, there will be some uh, erosion of, um, of city centre facilities uh, where the big events, the big venues may, may not be as, um, as, I wouldn't say they're not important, but the, the patronage and attendance will be, will be affected. And therefore, um, we will begin to see um, some rethinking. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that uh, Sep Ching's uh, 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 National Gallery would, would, uh, is not important anymore, but I think there needs to be rethinking as in terms of the, uh, the role of big venues vis-a-vis uh, -vis the more community-based kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of provisions. But um, then again, um, uh, we, we don't know because these are still, uh, we are still thinking through some of these issues, but certainly there will be implications for city planning uh, as in terms of vibrancy of the centre. Uh, we don't want the centre to hollow out. And of course, uh, uh, the tourism uh, industry. So, and life in, in the city as, as we know it uh, today. So, so, so some of these are the major impacts and implications that we will be uh, looking at. And uh, I want to just close off with two, uh, two illustrations. Okay, this is a scary costume because uh, the, the, the mask is actually in the shape of a beak of a bird, mainly because, and then you have the goggles, and then it's a fully clothed uh, person uh, to protect themselves against the virus. But really, um, uh, the, the use of the beak is to, to contain certain medication and, and fragrance and, and uh, it's a highly uh, 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 sort of a very detailed design of what it, it would look like at the, in those days. Uh, but but I think I think I think this really pull uh, uh, really highlight to us the whole issue of social distancing and um, uh, the whole idea of people separating from 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 others, uh, social distancing as in terms of what life will be like in the city. Of course, we are not going to be all wearing this kind of macabre uh, costume, but uh, wearing a mask and social distancing is here to stay, definitely at least in the immediate future. So I would say that uh, this, this will pose a major challenge to the arts. The reason main thing is that the arts and the cultural sector uh, relies on interaction, on participation, on communication, on proximity. And so uh, it will, there will be certain challenges that we would be looking at. And lastly, this, the mask is here to stay. And this is a painting by a uh, local artist, uh, Joseph Lee. Uh, he is, um, he, is uh, he does all these little sketches, you can see them all over, but really it's all about um, the now ubiquitous mask becomes the new social divider in a sense where it separates people. And we, need, we really need to be very, uh, uh, look closely at what are the implications as in terms of uh, the future of the art and culture industry. Uh, and, um, and this is something that we as, as planners, practitioners and academics will very much uh, look very closely into in terms of uh, uh, what are the major, uh, as a major challenge for the industry. All right, thank you. Let me thank both uh, Sia and Lai Chu for their uh, very insightful uh, sharing. There's um, 
Sack has talked about you know the way art is uh, driving change and how that has uh, helped to uh, ensure sustainability in cities and so on. And uh, Lai Chu has brought us on a tour of various art pieces, some of which uh, depicts the times when there were pandemics, huh? kind of scary piece, pieces too, you know, um, and so on. I have one question for uh, both of you. You've talked about the supply side of the arts, how things are, you know, coming on, how uh, policies and, and so on are put in place. But then how do you, how do you drive that demand part? How do you get people to come to you in normal times and during times such as a pandemic? Before that, th uh, thanks uh, like you for, for showing all that wonderful uh, work, work of art um, and uh, drawing all the, you know, the right, I guess, insights uh, in, into this, which also goes to show that Artists are very perceptive people and um, they comment about uh, social issues in a visually engaging and easy to access form. So as they say, right, a picture paints a thousand words and really, you know, it's so impactful. And that brings me then to, you know, uh, kind of answering Po Hong's question. Yeah, I guess with most things, uh, we need to convince people that there is value right, in whatever you are trying to promote. Um, and art, in terms of the value that it uh, provides, perhaps has not been, maybe it's been a bit underrated, uh, if not taken for granted. And we therefore uh, have to bring that to the fore. So it, it is incumbent on um, institutions like the gallery uh, and also uh, like NAC and MCCY to continue to promote the value of art and to make art more accessible uh, to uh, the public. Mm. Uh, and, and one of the approaches that we take at the gallery is to start from the very young. Mm. So uh, for those of you who have, may have visited the gallery, you notice that we have the Capital Centre for Art mm. Education. We invested a lot of money and a lot of space into it because we believe that the future uh, is in the kids. And the future of, you know, the, the way to grow an art-loving uh, society, a museum-going culture is to start with the children. Because with the kids, the parents come along, sometimes even the grandparents. So we see repeat visits by, the, by families, multi-generation, um, to come and enjoy and engage with the art. So the more we make the art more as an everyday accessible um, item then the more it becomes appreciated mm -hmm. and as well as of course then uh, extending the, the the value and the power of art into things like healing in therapy right in in creative thinking um, and i i believe that there are so many other ways that art can contribute to society uh, including even the economic sector and that has also not been mm. um promoted sufficiently because we yeah. we see we think that if it is art is something you know uh, the work of art on the wall or the sculpture or the music or the performance but if you think about all the innovation that goes into the design say of your furniture or the design of your website all this requires artistic creative talent and we don't uh, consider that you know as art uh, mm -hmm. and, but they are, right? So if you were to accumulate and value all of this, it is a significant tr contributor mm -hmm. to a, uh, in any economy today, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really about promoting uh, the, the value of art uh, mm -hmm. more. In that sense, uh, we're not doing that badly in Singapore because um, um, in terms of education, we also did some uh, study in terms of how art is incorporated into school curriculum and all that. Uh, certainly in the lower levels of uh, education, there is a lot of um, uh, 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 children still take art lessons and um, as well as, of course, music lessons and, and things like that. But I think as it gets to the higher levels, they start to 
branch into areas that they want to focus on, whether it's in science, in computers, in other areas. So I think education is important. Uh, I, I certainly agree with you. And um, I think we are looking at about 40-50% attendance at arts events. I think that's already a good number. When we did our benchmarking study, uh, that's also the kind of numbers we're looking at in, in, in many other cities. But I think when, I talk, when we talk about school children and young kids, um, it's, it's quite interesting because I remember I, I was at the museum, I was at the Van Gogh Museum in, in Amsterdam some years ago, and suddenly there was a huge noise and there was a lot of noise, of talking, chatting and all that. I see this huge bundle of kids came in and then the, the, the teacher was with them and they went straight to the, to the, uh, to the headsets and they all put on their headsets and they all you know, go from one piece to another where the teachers explain to them what's going on and all that. And I guess a lot of that comes from you know, the part, being part of school life and outing and make it a little fun thing and, um, and how you can actually you know, keep, keep, keep kids uh, engaged and, and interested. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think certainly uh, um, the whole the development of community art is is, is some is a direction that will will bode well for the future. Uh, uh, we when we were working with NSD, I think they are aware. They say a lot of people don't want to go uh, to the Singapore, uh, to the to the National Gallery. Or they don't want to go to uh, the Esplanade because uh, it is an effort, but also it's costly and it's not accessible and all that. But they would go if uh, there is a, a small little concert in the park. Uh, there is, you know, uh, we we used to run the. Uh, we have concerts in the park. Uh, we have got. Uh, 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 belly under the stars, we got a lot of these things that are actually very accessible. And I think increasingly we find that um, that's the kind of thing that attracts people. So going back to community, going back to neighborhoods, I think is something that uh, is, is a direction. And uh, NEC also recognized that, which is also why they actually commissioned that project uh, with us, mm. uh, 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 where we actually try to act, uh, look at some of the spatial and the design and the uh, other planning implications of, of doing art, mm. uh, uh, of making art more ubiquitous. Yeah, in fact, since you mentioned about some of the statistics, I, I do have some, uh, the latest on those yeah. numbers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so your, uh, you mentioned about 40%, right, of people yeah, for, attended uh, at least one art yeah, event. Yeah. In 2015, it yeah. shot up to 78%. Okay. And okay. that is the SG50 factor. Okay. Uh, in yeah. 2017, it Art event down. include things like some of the exhibitions. Yeah. Yes, yes, because yeah. there's a lot of you know, yeah. uh, art yeah. cultural activities yeah. at SG50. Yeah. Yeah. In 2017, it came down to about 54%. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah. we think so, it's a little bit more of the, the norm. Yeah. But, you know, the, right. so yeah. talking back to Po Hong's question 40, about... 50, that kind of percentage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we, we hope that it's more because, you know, in yeah. the Western countries, yeah. when you have nothing to do you think about going to the museums in singapore you have nothing to do you think of going to the shopping mall yes and uh, you know i think you get so much more of uh, visiting the museum and today's museums you, you've got food you've got cafe you've got you know interactive things right yeah but the other thing again back to um uh Paul's question about demand and supply uh i i really you know i i think it's about uh appreciating and understanding that uh, uh, art is actually very accessible yeah. and, and maybe we haven't done a good enough job to, you know, to promote that. Sure. Uh, the gallery is free for Singaporeans, yes. you know, you can yeah. come and enjoy the beautiful architecture and the air-conditioned space yeah. and go to the, yeah. the galleries for free. But, yeah. you know, people maybe still think, and believe me or not, some people are just fearful of stepping into the museum. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to make it less imposing yeah. and intimidating yes, yes. and and as a result in fact of COVID-19 and a rethinking of our role we mm. are now looking at bringing art to the people uh, so the Singapore Art Museum has already done it so we've mm. brought our works to uh, the National Library uh, and the gallery is now thinking of doing the same mm. uh, but their challenge is and this is something that uh, some people may not be aware. You know, all the art in our national collection, mm -hmm. they, they have to be uh, presented in a very tightly controlled environment. Mm -hmm. The relative humidity cannot be mm -hmm. more than 60, 65. Mm -hmm. Degrees temperature cannot be more than 20, 21 degrees. 
So it will be challenging to bring it out into the community. Yeah. Uh, so we have to find other ways, yeah. you know, of bringing uh, art and probably not the, 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 the actual real artwork, but mm. images or other yes, ways. Yes, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so these are some of the, I suppose, yeah. um, obstacles, but clearly there's still a lot of work that we need to do to sure. make art be more, you know, accessible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks both, uh, Siak and, uh, like you for sharing your views on how to drive demand. One more question before I take questions from the audience, and that is about financial sustainability. Mm. You know, um, in many countries, as you know, museums have a lot of support, both from government and for philanthropists. Mm. How is the situation like in Singapore? Mm. And how much more do you think needs to be done to make sure that such a art areas continue to be mm. financially sustainable? Mm. You, you know, um, I think we are very lucky in Singapore. We have as a, as a museum, public museum, compared to, you know, uh, our counterparts in Europe or in the US, we have a very strong financial uh, support from, from the government. Mm. But it's not enough, right? Uh, the gallery, for example, 70% uh, is funded by the government and we have to find the other 30% mm. either from, you know, our rentals of the venues or restaurants, F&D. Mm. Uh, ticketing is a very small amount because it's largely free. Uh, mm. And then, of course, patronage and donation is mm. very important. Yes. But art uh, philanthropy is, again, not ranked the highest. The, mm. the highest is always, you know, depending, education mm. or healthcare. Mm. And, and, and I would say that there's, uh, a growing pool of philanthropists. It was mm. very heartening when I saw the statistics that in the first five months of this year, mm. uh, about 90 million of donations were mm. given out. Mm. Uh, and that is about the same amount as the whole of last year. Mm. 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 But yeah. the bulk of it went to healthcare, mm. uh, yeah. which is understandable yeah. as well, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. when you have yeah. an existential health crisis. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then art. It was a, it's a struggle. My, my, my whole partnership team is like trying to crack their head. How do I, yeah. you know, still yeah. go and I know. not on doors? Yeah. And they feel very, um, you know, when businesses themselves are struggling, yeah. you cannot go and ask them for money. Okay. Right? Yeah. You have to That's be right. understanding. Yeah. 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 So it will yeah. be a challenge yeah. and we just have to find ways to yeah. manage our costs yeah. and to look at other ways of support. Mm. Yeah, certainly. I think... Uh, uh, we were looking at uh, cities like Montreal and uh, New York and and I think um, the support coming from uh, uh, the corporations uh, uh, you, you there is a, a fair amount of support coming from 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 the private sectors and um, I, I think this is not just in the arts area there's also other areas I mean health and education is quite clear education in fact has a larger mm -hmm. share in terms of the pie from philanthropy. But uh, there's growing, it is a growing uh, area, people start to recognize. But I think the main point is that in times of crisis, I think that would actually come uh, to the end of, to the, to the lower end of the packing order. So therefore, mm -hmm. um, I think we need some other ways of sus sustenance. And I, and I think there's so many different things that people are doing in, 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 um, in other cities where you talk about loaning and people do loan artwork and and uh, we talk about also things like um, uh, private collectors um, uh, mm -hmm. who open up their, their collections uh, themselves. They may not loan, but they may open up their collections. So there are things like that uh, happening. Um, and I, I guess um, uh, it, is a, it is a big challenge, uh, undeniably, for Singapore as a small country, it is a big challenge. But, uh, but I think in good times, um, uh, it will it, uh, th hope that things will, will turn around. But now with the crisis, I would, I would certainly think that um, uh, we will go through a long period and, and hopefully mm -hmm. uh, uh, that will be a time for consolidation, a time to actually rebuild um, or, or reinforce uh, relationships with the corporate world. Uh, I was also quite amazed uh, looking at some of the 
big companies, they all have their own little collections. They all have their own little galleries, quite a few of them. They were very proud to show off. But I, I think we, we, we don't have that level where we say they will share or they will open up and they would make known. And uh, I don't see a lot of that happening uh, in Singapore as well. So I guess, uh, uh, I mean, we are very fortunate, as Hatching says, the government plays a big role, but you can't just rely on the government to grow the art sector. And, and just, just to add that, it, uh, more and more of our private collectors in Singapore today yeah, are yeah. Uh, yeah, sharing. donating their art, even the artists, which is really very heartwarming. Yeah, the artists yeah. themselves are donating, yeah. the corporates are also doing so. And even if they don't donate, the fact that they are sharing, so mm. opening up private museums, yeah. adding to the whole art ecosystem, and yes. it's very healthy. Yes. Thanks for your um, comments, uh, both Siak and Lai Chu. Perhaps I move on to the uh, questions from the chat group. Eh? Um, there's this question from uh, Ho Kwan Rong, which has actually generated a few uh, rejoinders to it. But essentially, he's asking, does a real estate with better architecture give this building a higher valuation? Mm. How do you quantify its value? I'm asking this since you know, both of you are also, you know, uh, involved in valuation of sorts. You see that, so why do developers hire uh, well-known architects uh, or rather award-winning architects and, and advertise in their uh, in the brochures and in their advertisement that oh this is this uh, this building is designed by so and so and so and so. I think certainly there's value in good design. Uh, there's value in good design that's also uh, that people can appreciate. Sometimes good design um, uh, fails to engage uh, with the uh, the viewer or the or, or, or people who um, who thinks that um, they they don't understand what it is. But I think the market today is uh, is quite sophisticated, the real estate market, and there is sufficient uh, I think recognition of good architecture. I, I don't think um, I don't know whether about valuation, whether you add this, you get X percent increase. But people do use that as a marketing tool. Uh, developers do use that as a marketing tool. I mean, earlier section talks also about the nature part and then the gardens and the landscapes and all that is now being been built in because people do appreciate it. And uh, um, and and I feel that the market is actually uh, sophisticated enough uh, to actually. Um, uh, a, a regard architecture and design and good aesthetics as, as part and parcel of uh, 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 of their, their benchmark, uh, the evaluation mm -hmm. of buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Uh, what about you, Sia? And I'll just add. Uh, I agree, uh, like you. And I'll just add that for the value to then sustain itself, mm. I think the the functionality of the design is very mm. important because a, a building is ultimately designed for the purpose that it's created for. So it may be a beautiful design, but if it is not functional, uh, it, it will be very hard to uh, sustain its value. So you, good architects, I would say, normally don't just think about how iconic the design is, but it's also about how functional uh, does it serve the purpose. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> Some... architecture is also, the beauty is always uh, in the eyes of uh, the beholder, right? Beholder because there are some that create a lot of controversy and as a result, it adds value to it. You know, there are people, uh, just now I think Siak shared the Bibao, uh, the Frank Gehry, Instagram and so on. Some, some people don't like it, right? Of mm. course, there are some who do. So anyway, it's, it's how the beholder sees it and that's where the value comes in. Eh? Um, one question on, um, this is from Aaron Lim. He talks about uh, the Guggenheim effect enjoyed exclusively by very specific architects or specific cities. Others that come to mind include MoMA in uh, New York, uh, IM Pace, Louvre, and so on. And he says, I would think Singapore's NVS by Safdie also exhibited some of this positive Guggenheim effect. However, there's apparently a diminishing return for such architectural icons in bringing value as we see here in Singapore. How should we then think about adding more of such icons to our landscape, to our cityscape? Aaron? Yes, uh, hi, thanks. Thanks for taking the question. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that we already have a very vibrant built environment in terms of our city center cityscape. And for us to add more of such buildings, you know, to Gardens by the Bay, MBS, we have Power 4 coming up. 
and so many more iconic buildings, the diminishing return is in debt, right? Mm. Mm, mm. One, it becomes common, yeah. Right? yeah. Mm. One in Singapore, every corner is an iconic building, right. and houses which you are competing against, and so many different things in Singapore. So how should we then go about thinking about a direction for our future? I think it's an interesting way of looking at it in terms of returns, but I think from my perspective, the more the, the better. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things I, I found um, with some with cities, if you visit a lot of cities, um, uh, as, as the city, um, as, as you get more and more of these interesting buildings, some of the things that we do, you go and then you, you want to look and you say what is next and which is the next one and you want to explore the city more. And I think, I think there is, um, uh, it gives the city greater uh, depth and greater level of interest and a greater level of, um, you know, offering in terms of excitement and in terms of surprises and in terms of, you know, how people can relate to the city. So I, I think if you, unfortunately, I think the problem arises when you have more of the same thing. If everybody, uh, somebody builds, uh, uh, you know, um, a building with some sky terraces, and everybody builds sky terraces in the same way, uh, yeah, it's more the same thing, and yes, you 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 don't get that 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 same effect anymore. So I think it's a challenge to designers, you know, to every now and then refresh, you know, uh, with new ideas and uh, 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 new uh, uh, levels of um, uh, presentation in terms of uh, of 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 their yeah, architecture. And I, I really think that um, there's no such a thing as um, uh, uh, not good to have more. But I think. Uh, Unless, of course, it's a case of just repeating the same old formula. I think that's where it, mm. it fails. Yeah. And I would. Bill Bao that, is, of uh, course, yeah. Uh, yeah. is a uh, is a uh, one off. You know, Andrew Gary's yeah. works always like that. He he builds yeah. Bill Bao. He doesn't build the same thing. I mean, his yes. his mm. Gary Gallery in New York is is, is a very yes. totally different, different yeah. kind of mm. uh, experimenting thing. So mm. I, I think mm. I think we need more more of that kind of uh, of. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, you wanted to add to yeah, that? No, and I, I, just two things. One is that, in fact, some of our local architects can come up with just amazing, equally, you know, uh, iconic uh, design. But, yeah. but also equally important is conserving our old buildings mm. so that you have a nice blend of old and new. And I yeah. see that happening more uh, in Singapore, which is a really good thing because we mm. do, while we are not so, such a long legacy and history, but we do have some rather... Uh, historically uh, significant buildings uh, which we are uh, preserving more of. So that nice blend, you know, of, uh, of old and new, I think will make for a very vibrant city. Yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this thing called blending is important. You want to retain the old, yet at the same time, rejuvenate the area and, and so on. Mm. Okay, this uh, one says, the art pieces shared today were mostly paintings, architecture, by famous and professional artists and architects. How about artworks in the form of graffiti and urban murals? How are they viewed in the space of urban planning and real estate? One of my favorite artists is actually a graffiti Thanks. artist. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. And, and, I was going to yeah, say that. <laughs> yeah. Don't you agree? I mean, like you, he's so creative and his, yeah. his works are just so um, topical. <laughs> very critic as well uh, but just that very simple uh, message that he puts on the wall uh, it's a commentary on yeah. the world mm. at that point in time yeah uh, so graffiti art is just one form of of art and if you think about uh, Penang I come from Penang so uh, one of the things that uh, has made Penang also quite famous from the uh, urban kind of perspective is that this Lithuanian artist just went around and started build, you know, painting graffiti and that has become a, a draw, a tourist draw uh, for Penang and many other cities now, Ipoh and all that is Malacca all following. So, yeah. so graffiti art and art in public spaces is another very form, it's a very important form of making art very accessible mm -hmm. to the men uh, in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, in Singapore, I think unfortunately mm -hmm. uh, we are still mm -hmm. a little bit too uh, careful and we yeah. don't want, you know, we see graffiti as like uh, um, uh, untidy. Yeah. Uh, so I think we need to loosen up a bit on that because yes. uh, really that becomes a very nice uh, additional feature of the urban landscape. Yeah. 
Yes, I certainly agree. Uh, I think Banksy is, of course, unique. Uh, having a, a Banksy in the city is really like a, a, a little gift to the city. But of course, um, uh, some years back, if you remember, uh, somebody did a, a, a Banksy uh, imitation and tried to uh, uh, did this graffiti on an MRT train, and and they were yeah. they were hotly pursued by 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 the government, and I think we have a very low to level of tolerance for for the thin line between graffiti and vandalism. You know, we have very low tolerance for that. Mm. Um, but I think um, in terms of the development of the city as a whole, one of the important aspect uh, in our in our study of sustainability is about pervasiveness of art. And we say that, um, I think the literature mm -hmm. would tell us and a lot of case studies would tell us that art is not always about uh, being confined to galleries or being confined mm -hmm. to museums, but actually it should be out in the street. And street art, I think, is something that is, is happens in Australian cities, Melbourne, you go to the alleys, you go to uh, you know, mm -hmm. some of the smaller roads, a lot of street art flourish. You go to Paris, the centre of, you know, of, of of you know art or of culture and people are painting everywhere on the pavement you know. even in bali you go to ubud you know every other person is an artist because they it has got that culture and we haven't gotten that yet because we we still think of art as in terms of you know you know what it is as in terms of exhibitions and museums mm -hmm. and all that. And I think there's certainly mm -hmm. need for us to, to redefine and to open up certain spaces. And some spaces, at the moment, uh, the only thing I can think of is Haji Lane. Haji Lane has got some lovely, you know, uh, so-called graffiti. But I yeah. think in a lot of ways, a lot of this is still controlled. So I feel that, but, but, but certainly, uh, it's not just about graffiti. I think we're really also talking about things like, um, uh, art sculpture, uh, sculpture. We are also thinking about uh, opportunities for people to do experimental um, uh, things. You know, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, fabric painting and a whole lot of other things. And I think a lot of these are little cottage things, things people do at home. And I, I really feel there is there is room for us to actually expand in that area. And we haven't yeah. we haven't gone very far in that yet. I think the government would not put money to promote graffiti art for sure. Although I remember when I was, uh, I was sort of somewhat involved in the rail corridor uh, uh, development, mm -hmm. and there was an area underneath the, um, uh, underneath the, uh, uh, the MRT station at Bona Vista, where mm -hmm. uh, planners decided let's keep leave this wall and let people paint. And a lot of some of the, them they come they come in and they, mm -hmm. they paint. Mm -hmm. and it was a very good experiment. It was done in. Um, it was in Berlin. I think this was the uh, the the uh, Sungerland. It is also a linear park, and they actually dedicated one wall. They said this wall is free. Anybody come. So every weekend, people bring their pots of paint, and they go. Another guy will come in and paint it over, and overnight another guy will come in. So it's a continuous change in that in that in that area. And so it was fun for people. It's also way people to, uh, let the kids experiment with different things. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I feel maybe we haven't done enough of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. I, I must give a, a kind of a shout out to LTA for their Art in Transit program yeah. because uh, they've now purposefully uh, planned for artworks to be in the MRT uh, mm. stations, underground yeah. stations and with yeah. different locations having more unique uh, community-based art but working with artists, right? Yeah. So I think once they propagate more of that, you know, you'll see more, we'll see uh, more. more yeah. art of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that'd be nice. Right, right. Thank you. So with such ardent champions, you know, from uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Siak as well as in Lai Chiu, I think the arts definitely has a good future and can be uh, sustained. <laughs> right, I mean, adds to the sustainability. But uh, what we can learn from uh, both of you is, you know, how art has to be accessible, how art has to, you know, uh, appreciation of art has to uh, start from young. It needs to be government as well as private sector uh, support to create the sustainability for the arts for now as well as for the future because sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present generation whilst without compromising the needs of the future generation. Huh? So on um, that note, it leaves me uh, to thank on behalf of our Department of Real Estate and Institute of Real Estate and Urban Studies, thank our two uh, panelists Chong Siak Chin and 
by Chu Maloney. Very good yes. perspective. So I hope our participants have learned something from it. Thank you.